Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Robcast. And this one is part two with Kristen Bell. Kristen Bell is in the house. At the table. It it is her house, so that's not that's fairly normal. And yet so exciting for me. Um, every time that you come on the Robcast, I just love it. I just Thanks. love it. And that part one about anxiety, sheesh, there was a lot there. And just, it's just so much to think about. And I just love all the fresh ideas you have. Um, let me say a few things about tour, and then we have to jump into part two. Great. Because we just announced new dates for the Introduction to Joy tour. Uh, Nebraska's been up. Kansas City, those tickets have been up. Same with Oklahoma City and Tulsa. I'm coming your way. But then tickets just went up for Tucson, Mesa. Those are two fine cities in Arizona. San Diego, California. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama, brothers and sisters, I am coming your way. <laughs> so, And then uh, last weekend I was in Florida for the start of this tour. And all you Tampa and Orlando people, thank you for making the beginning of the tour just oh my word i'm so thrilled i get to do this this year and uh and that guy i met this fellow named sebastian who said that he can't wash the dishes without listening to the robcast or maybe he said he can't listen to the robcast without washing dishes but anyway that guy made me laugh so hard and so wherever sebastian is doing your dishes <laughs> It's you people. <laughs> it's a shout out to Seriously, the, Kristen. the dishwashers. You would have laughed. This guy was just, these people, you, you people out there, just endlessly entertain and inspire me to no end. <laughs> I'm still laughing about that. So that's a few things. Oh, and uh, last year's tour was called the Holy Shift Tour, and you can download the audio. We recorded one of the tour stops. If you want to hear last year's tour, that's at the site as well at my site, robbill.com. I don't know why I say it that way. But <laughs> because you have a radio voice. <laughs> <laughs> but now um, we have Kristen Bell with us for part two on anxiety. And I feel like there's so much in part one that we could go back through or review. But then I also see that you have a stack of notes there, which implies we're headed forward so yeah I, I think it would be great to just um review just a little bit okay um last time we talked about well the way i like to think about it is the anxiety map mm -hmm. um and so it actually feels kind of perfect that there was a part one because in my head in on the map there's kind of a, a step one and a step two and mm -hmm. for me the step one is the idea that um our nervous systems are designed to handle danger and stress. And um, we switch into that instantly when we perceive that we're, that there's danger or we're under some sort of threat. Um, and we gradually move into the other state, which is the parasympathetic, which is the calm centered state that helps our body rest, digest and heal. And um, often what happens is we can get stuck in the danger state because it's so easy to get there. And it takes a little, it takes more intention to move into the opposite state. Not really opposite. I kind of think of it as a yin yang. Yeah. And um, both are needed. Both are needed. And it's not, it's not like you're in one or the other. It's if you picture a scale, um, one is just more dominant than the other. But I think a lot of times with anxiety, we can get stuck in that danger state. Um, and we talked a little bit about how some people have the wiring, uh, nervous systems, brain structures. They have, they have the wiring where they take in um, a lot more stimulus and they also maybe um, are just more reactive. So, yeah. so that type of person too can easily get stuck in that um, danger state where everything is on for emergency, um, 
and lots of things are, lots of organs and systems are shut off because our body wants all the resources going towards let's get out of this dangerous situation. So that first step on the map is um, what are some tools for moving from the danger state into that calm, centered, relaxed state? Um, and I think of it as a circle because, first of all, it's, it's kind of a big, it's a big idea. Um, yeah. This idea that we have control. We have more control than we realize. And um, for me, it's, I think it's also a big circle because it's like the first stop. Like, let's stop here first. Let's make sure that when we're experiencing anxiety, let's make sure that we've done what we know to do to get in that more calm-centered nervous system state. And what I noticed about what you said last time, can I interrupt? Yeah. Was that do. even interrupting? <laughs> Was I interrupting? Um, is that somebody may have more of a wiring or a disposition to be in danger state faster. Right. Um, but that when you introduce the idea of you have more control over this, for the person who's like, well, I guess this is just how I am, there's like two things going on, and I guess this is just how I am. You're, uh, what I heard you saying is, yes, you may be one of those people whose knobs are just turned up more. So yeah. Um, but also within, I guess this is just how I am, there is, it's not like a disempowered victim posture. It's a, you actually have control within that no matter how you're wired. Right. And I actually think both parts are empowering because understanding yes. that you're wired this way helps you not beat up on yourself yeah, or, right. or try to force yourself to be something you're not. It, it helps you accept the way you are and find the gifts in it. And, and then the other part is you feel more empowered because you can take 10 minutes or I mean, 20 minutes, you can, if you're in a situation and you notice that you're in that kind of spinning, um, anxiety, danger state, you can like, you can like go sit in the bathroom for a little bit, like, and breathe. There are some things you can do that, um, you just may need to use those tools much more than other people who yeah. don't, who aren't as reactive. And don't apologize and don't defend and don't rationalize. Just this is what I need. And take care in order of yourself. To thrive. Yeah. 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 So the other reason why to me it's a circle um, is I, I picture like a line going round and round and round because the idea is that the more you practice this, the more you practice getting into that parasympathetic state, um, the more your brain changes. And we, we mentioned neuroplasticity and... Um, I didn't mention that one of the words that I came across that, that helped me kind of picture what's going on in the brain is the Spanish word for plasticity is plasticina. I may not be saying that right. Plasticina. Yes. And um, which is also the word uh, that they use for Play-Doh. <laughs> so it's the idea that our brains are very malleable. And yeah. the more we integrate something into our lives that we do every day, the more the, the, the um, I don't know why I just lost the word, but the, um, <laughs> the neural circuitry yeah. changes. Yeah. Um, and that's very, Amazing. to me, that's so encouraging because it means you don't have to have the same brain that you have today in the future. Like you do, again, you have more control than you realize. And it does happen with repetition and it happens over time and so sometimes people get discouraged like why isn't this happening faster but that's what's exciting about all this new research that's coming out on neuroplasticity is it shows you this is happening like stick with it it is happening and um that's also why i think it's so important when you add these practices into your life that you enjoy them because it is something you want to do every day. And when you enjoy something, you're going, yeah. you're going to be drawn to it. Like, I, yeah. I, I mean, me included, but a lot of people say, like, I don't have time. I don't have time to meditate, or I don't have time to do a yoga class, or um, I don't have... But if you, 
if you think about how much time we spend ruminating, how much time we spend worrying, how much time, like how, how many times I'm like, whether it's sitting in the car or just those 10 minutes here or there, that my mind is going crazy and it's n not only not a good use of time, it's actually having, yeah. having the opposite effect. So what if I had something that I really enjoyed? Like, honestly, for me right, right now, I am loving these, these guided meditations that I found on YouTube. And I think the reason why I enjoy it so much is because I love the feeling that I get when I meditate. Like, I just love that peaceful, centered feeling. And so more and more I'm having the connection when I feel off to be like, oh, I know what I could do to feel yeah. that great feeling that I feel when I'm centered. And it's also interesting how uh, patterns, habits, and rituals spill over into the rest of life because you taste something better like a state of being, a calm, a peace, a groundedness. And then it's almost like it calls out the rest of life. When you and I have talked about Sabbath um, and talked about Sabbath on the Robcast, you spend a day present, different than the other days. It like spills over into the other days. Yes. Because once your brain is like doing better, it's not revving, spinning, then those other times start to feel more, it's like you can see them for their absurdity. Almost. Yeah, and sometimes I think it's helpful when we're feeling off or anxious, um, w whatever we are on that scale, like just feeling a little, I don't know, the word that comes to agitated. mind. Like agitated. Agitated yeah. or dishevel disheveled emotionally. <laughs> emotionally um, <laughs> disheveled. Yes. That's a good phrase. Um, all the way to all the... All the way to like extreme anxiety. It's really helpful to have like maybe a list of three or four things that you enjoy and that puts you in a better state of mind. Like yeah. taking a hot bath with, yeah. with you have your go-to things with music on yeah. and a candle. Like you have your things like, okay, this is my remedy box. When I'm feeling this way, these are the things I go to remedy box. Because I think I noticed for myself in the past when I would get in those states, instead of, okay, what would be really enjoyable right now? I would just beat myself up more. Like, what is go what's wrong with me? Uh, Why it. is this happening? I just need to power through. I just need to get a few more things done. That's actually one of my big lies that I would believe is, well, I'll feel better when I get this thing done. Instead of, you know what, I'm not in a good space right now to get this done. I'm yeah. going to like just leave it for 20 minutes Yeah. and see if in 20 minutes I'm in a better state to come back to it. I've noticed that about you, by the way, observation. Oh, that I've changed in that way? Uh, that, you're, that you are much more ruthless about, who am I kidding? This is ridiculous. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm stopping right here. I'm not going to like push through and just be even more miserable. I'm going to go whatever, and then come back. By the way, you're, uh, this, is, this could be like a thing, like Kristen Bell wants you to build a remedy box. <laughs> remedy box is a good one. Yeah. You got to build a remedy box and have some stuff in it. Right. Like. <laughs> I don't know why when you're in a bad state, it's hard to think of those things. I don't know why. Oh, interesting. So you, uh, one of the, the very ir some of the irrational nature of anxiety is the things that you most need to get out of it. You can't, it's like f foggy. You can't find it. Yeah. So you got to build like a box. It's right. like right there. When, when you're in that good state, <laughs> you got to build your box. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And then what's in your, yeah, that's good. That's really good. Build a remedy box, have it nearby. Um, okay. Sorry. Keep going. You're okay. on a roll. Well, I wanted to, um, I wanted to actually, st this is kind of the start of part two, but I wanted to start it with a, a study. And the reason why is because, well, it, it's very encouraging as far as neuroplasticity, but also I think that's one of the things that research has done for us recently is there's these things that we know are good for us. And I mean, 
I talk to so many people who like want to add something like meditation into their life. But sometimes we need a lot of like, um, I don't, I'm, I want to say evidence mm -hmm. for why, why it actually is helpful or why it actually works. And so, um, this is a study that was done over 15 years ago, um, by kind of some fathers of meditation and mindfulness, um, Davidson and John Kabat-Zinn. John Kabat-Zinn has written a couple What's really... the title of the one? Oh. There's the big monstrous one. Right. Um, Catastrophe up. Free Living or something like that? Yeah. So anyway, Rob's going to look for the book. Full Catastrophe Living. Full Catastrophe living. But anyway, about 15 years ago, he did this research study um, because he wanted to see if um, there was a brain shift that happened when people started engaging with meditation. And it was based on the fact that calm and happy people typically have more activity in the left prefrontal cortex compared to the right. Um, they also have less stress hormone in their system. They recover faster from negative events and they have better immune function. So all of those are very desirable things. Yes. <laughs> and he um, noticed that people who reported more stress and reported that they were basically t had a, a lot more negative stress in their life all the time, um, they had more activity in the right prefrontal cortex compared to the left. And then they also had more activity in the amygdala, which um, I briefly mentioned in part one, which is the part of the brain that regulates intense um, negative emotions such as fear and anxiety. So um, there really is a difference in brain function between people who report being happy and calm and people who report being more stressed and anxious. But what he wanted to see, since he's a meditation teacher, is if the brain would change with meditation. And he set up an eight-week meditation class for people who had never meditated before. And they did about two and a half hours of meditation a week. Um, and that equals about 20 minutes a day. And at the end of the eight weeks, they found that the people who meditated showed a profound shift from left prefrontal cortex to right. I'm sorry, the other way around. A shift towards the left from the right. Um, and they also showed a significant increased immune response. Those are the two things that they measured the at the end. The immune system. Amazing. Yeah, but the reason why this is so encouraging is because just after eight weeks of engaging in meditation, the brain was operating differently. The brain, yeah. the, the brains of the people who reported to be more stressed were now looking like the brains of the people who were reporting to be more calm the and brain, centered. So the brain, with whatever trillions of connections, billions of neurons, et cetera, the most complicated thing in the universe that we know of, also happens to be incredibly nimble and flexible, which is astonishing. Well, one of the words I've come across is it's very efficient. Yeah. It responds to what we do every day. So yeah. it's always pruning back neural connections that we're not using, and then it's forming new ones based on what we do every day. It's so interesting when you say that. The, all of the ways in which people get stuck in thinking, like, well, this is just how it is. This is just how it's going to be. Nothing's going to... When what we know for sure from science is the brain is like, oh, we could just change that. Like the brain is like standing there going, well, we could just drop that one. That belief isn't helpful or that idea. Do you know what I mean? Like right. the brain is just wired to go, well, okay, well, then let's change. Well, we can kind of be our own science experiments. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really kind of, I don't, yeah. that kind of charges me up. Like, I, I mean, you can think about it as we're creating our own lives. But we can also like, we can like try things. Like let's add this for eight weeks. <laughs> and not in like a, 
I got to have somebody hold me accountable and I got to like... Just make it like, one more heavy thing you have to do, right? Which I think is why for some people, a, a class is really helpful in the beginning. Oh, sure. I know for me, in the in the beginning, I could only meditate in a group. There was something about a group energy with everybody doing the same thing yeah. that helped me like drop into it. Absolutely. But um, But that was also before I discovered YouTube. <laughs> I'm just a big fan of all the different guided meditations on YouTube. You know, I do remember you, this was a while ago, saying, I'm going to, you, when you started talking about dealing with anxiety, I remember you saying you were going to try everything. You were going to like set out, like your whole, we are, would you say we're our own ex science experience? Yeah. But I'm, I, I remember distinctly thinking that was, it was very entertaining, but profound when you were like, I'm going to try all, I'm going to figure out this anxiety thing. I'm going to just try a bunch of things and see what works. Yes. We are our own science experiments. That's a good one. But what's the other one? Remedy box? Build a remedy box. You are your own science experiment. I'm just going to, just every once in a while, stop part two and, and Great. try to name the title like of that. this section. I like that. Okay, keep going. Well, I, I just want to say, because I mentioned YouTube, um, they have, there are the best guided med meditations there. And like, I've, I've tried everything from like yoga nidra, which is a type of yoga where you're, um, you're laying, you lay down and somebody guides you through focusing on different parts of your body, which is a really interesting practice to me because when you do that, it does a lot of things. First, it slows your thoughts because it's giving you something to focus on. It, um, you're focusing in on different parts of your body, so you're becoming very present in your body. Um, and it, it's, it's slow, it's slow and present. So it's just, um, it's slowing everything down and helping you be present. So like for a long time, yoga nidra was my thing and I would every day mm -hmm. lay down and do like a yoga nidra practice that I would you know, you just type it in on YouTube and you find it. Um, N I D R A. R -A. Okay. Yeah, I think it, the actual term is like, I think it's called sleep yoga or rest yoga, something along those lines. Like, who it's, doesn't love that? Right. It's it's the best kind of exercise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can also like, if you just have ten minutes in the morning and you you feel like you need some topic. Yeah. Like healing or surrender or love you just do like you type in 10 minute love meditation i mean there's <laughs> it's amazing there's everything there so i'm just saying like i've gone through different phases where different um teachers or yeah. subjects or sometimes i would just do like meditation music but there's just so many things um I know other people are able to slow their thoughts and get into a meditative state by um, listening to their breath or having a mantra, like a centering prayer mantra, and all of those things work. I guess I'm just saying all this because there are so many ways to do this, and there's so many ways to find the thing that works for you and the thing that you will look forward to doing every day. Yeah, what will you look forward to doing? Yeah. There we go. That's a good one. That's yeah. a good question to ask. Yeah, and also before we move on, I mean that I wanted to talk about that study f because I'm such a believer in meditation, but also because it demonstrates how a practice like quieting your mind um, really does change your brain. So change is possible. Wherever you are today, change is possible. And it comes in little steps, but it's happening. And that's, that's the I really love exciting it. thing. I love how, un how underneath everything that you say about this topic, you just keep coming back to like hope. Yeah. Change. You can do this. This is possible. You don't have to be stuck. I, I like, well, like I love also, that they just keep coming back to that base note. Sometimes I think with something like anxiety, it feels like two steps forward, one step back. Mm -hmm. And 
I think it's really important in those times where you feel the one step back to be able to look at the, the little steps of progress that you've made, whether it's, you know what, I'm sleeping better than I used to, or I know what to do when I get in this state. Um, I just think it's really important to like not give up and go down the spiral. Yeah. So actually, before we move on, um, I wanted to mention a couple other activities that move you into the parasympathetic, which we talked about in part one. Um, these are just a few more to add to your remedy box. If you, (laughs) if these are what get you excited, um, But one that researchers found is that the emotion of love gets us into the parasympathetic, that calm, centered state. And the reason why is because um, of the hormone oxytocin. It it activates that whole um, system. So any time you feel that feeling of love, whether you think it, you know, whether you think about the person or the pet or whatever it is that you love, um, or you're actually with that person. And I know for me, one of the things I do, um, first thing in the morning is wake Violet up and she's always asleep. (laughs) Um, and so I get in bed with her and I just hug her and think about her and the wonder of her. And that's just one of those things that's easy to do that's enjoyable to do that's natural and it it puts you in that state so oxytocin i thought that could help people think creatively about yeah right that right. um and then movement where you're fully present so i think for you that's what surfing does for you absolutely. like you said it calms your thoughts it, absolutely so any kind of movement movement where you're fully present like i think of tai chi um walking yoga um some people need to have their body involved to help slow the thoughts that would be Um, me and then the last one is singing dancing and laughter so anything that makes you happy anything that like lifts the burdens of whatever it is you're carrying around um is going to put you in that state and again those those are enjoyable things to do that make you happy yeah so i think about liz who started she started (laughs) she started 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 doing dancing as a way to start her day like you know do the shuffle on her itunes and whatever song comes up she dances to it and she talked about how life-changing that has been this year i love Um, it it's amazing to me in the mornings when i take val to school and sit in Los Angeles traffic, how many people are singing in their cars? Like there was a woman today in a white Honda just going for it, like with the windows up and my windows were up and I could hear her clearly. I was like, that lady is going to arrive wherever she's going in in fit shape. You know what I mean? <laughs> Ready for whatever this day's doing. Well, that's one of the interesting <laughs> things about driving is you kind of have to put your to-do list away. Yeah, yeah. And you're, you, you can take that time to be more fully present. Like you're not going to get anything else done. So be present, like, yeah, sing, dance, whatever it right. is. Um, that's, that's interesting. That can really be a, a time of connection. Yeah. It's also interesting now with the interweb the way it is, how many things you can now access. Like how many things are right there? Even like, even just like great comedians are all like right there on your phone. Um, like your remedy box now can be like really True. big, really big. True. Okay. So th- this is actually the beginning of part two. <laughs> <laughs> and the way I see it on the map, it's like the, you've come out of the circle. You've done all the stuff that you know to do in your yeah. remedy box. And what if you still have anxiety? Yeah. Um, Because sometimes I feel like that moving into parasympathetic takes care of it. And then other times I'm like, okay, I'm still anxious. Now what? And the way I see this part is like a windy trail. And 
this part is about how anxiety is your friend and wants to take you on a journey. Oh, that's a good line. That's a good, it's like you calm the body, physiologically, physically, you've calmed the body down, something's still there, and what's there is anxiety going, hey, I'm your friend, let's go. Right. We're going to have to go do some hunting. So, is it hunting, exploring, discovering? What would you say? I would say discovery. Okay, so now, so now the posture is, apparently there's some truth that anxiety wants to tell me? Is that how you'd say it? Yeah, I think there's a truth aspect. Um, but first, let's get into like what what I mean when I say anxiety is your friend, because that can be yeah for a lot of people like what I've been trying to get rid of this <laughs> my whole yeah. life. What do you mean it's my <laughs> yeah. friend? Um, but I think it's really helpful to change the way you see anxiety. I think it's helpful to stop the push against it. It's here, so let's have a different posture. Like, what does it want to tell me? And I. I think the first step, I have um, two steps in this process, um, is that anxiety is not you. It's not you. You are the witness of your anxiety. So a good, a good way that I approach that when anxiety pops up, and let's say I'm about to walk into a party and I'm filled with anxiety, I say, oh, look, this is anxiety. How interesting. I'm going to figure out what this, what it's trying to tell me later. Like right now, I'm just going to take a few deep breaths. But maybe, maybe later I'll go explore what this was all about. And for me, what it does is it takes the pressure off. It like lightens it up. It's not like, oh, why do I, I like, I've been doing this for so, I've been doing these practices for so long. I can't believe I still have anxiety or whatever the thing is that pops up, but it's like, you know what, this anxiety is not me, it's here. So, huh, this is interesting. I uh, saw you do this. Yeah, I did this just recently, didn't I? Yes, we went to that party and um, we got to the bottom of the stairs. We were arriving, we're at the bottom of the stairs. We could hear all the people up at the top of those stairs. Mm -hmm. I watched you do this. You'd st you said something, whatever it is that you said, it was literally like I could see you you acknowledge some like, oh my word, this is not, this makes me anxious or something, but it's almost like you just said it and almost like placed it on the steps. You yeah, know what I mean? I mean like you I like stood outside it. of it. I still felt it all the way up the steps, but I felt it was empowering because I was like, yeah. oh, here comes anxiety, but I'm still going to walk up those steps. I, I watched, I witnessed and this. The reason why I don't, <laughs> the reason why anxiety is distressing to me in those kind of situations is because I feel like it robs me of the experience. Like, I feel like I'm not able to be myself. I feel like I'm not able to enjoy what's going on around me. Um, like there's lots of reasons why I don't want that anxiety there, but there's something that happens when I can just be like, huh, look, it's anxiety. I feel it. And I'm going to like walk right through it. And I do find that when I can do that and I get into the party and maybe I start to have a conversation where I'm feeling a little safer, like it, it does, oftentimes it does mm -hmm. go away. Um, so I think it just, I think it takes huh. the pressure off, it lightens mm -hmm. up the whole situation and it stops the downward spiral because the downward spiral is the worst. And I feel like when you start going down the spiral, then that's when you really cut yourself off from things because you probably will start avoiding parties. You just make a statement like, I'm not, I'm not good with social interaction. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever labels you put on yourself, you just start like cutting yourself off from life instead of walking into it anyway. Um, could, would you say... When you mention the downward spiral, it's interesting about a downward spiral generally has some element of question that leads, like, what is this? What's, well, what's wrong with me? Why am I always like this? Oftentimes it feels like a spiral is a, an unending series of questions. And what you're saying here about, oh, look, anxiety is, it's not a question. It's a statement. 
And that's how it sort of kneecaps all the questions is instead of like, what's, what is this? What's going on? What's happening to me? Why well, is this happening? It's just, this is anxiety, which sort of brings, oh. Well, I think there's there something that happens when you separate it from who you are. Mm. This, is a, this is a feeling. This is an emotional state that's coming up. It's not who you are. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not, um, it's not a statement about your value or your goodness or your abilities. It just is. It's just this thing. Um, oh, that's great. That's great. You separate anxiety from your deepest self, essence, being. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's the same thing that happens with meditation is you become the witness of your thoughts. So I'm just taking this yeah, right. To I mean, ang right. anxiety is a a bunch of thoughts. Yes. So in that moment, if you can become the witness of all these crazy thoughts that are going on, um, yeah, yeah. you realize that it's it's has nothing to do with actually who you are. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 in obviously lots of traditions, the question becomes, well, who's doing the witnessing? There's obviously you're witnessing to them, which means something is somebody is witnessing, which means there's something deeper within you than just whatever it is you're witnessing to. So it like ground, like you talk about being grounded and centered, it grounds you and centered is you in something deeper than just this particular sentiment or emotion, namely anxiety. Yeah. Whew. yeah. I mean, okay. in some ways it's about who's, um, who's in the driving seat. Yes, exactly. Okay. So the second step is, um, can you find the good in it? And um, two ways I'd like to suggest that anxiety is helpful. I mean, later I have three big ways that anxiety is our friend, but these are just kind of like to help you shift your view on sometimes anxiety is good for us. Um, anxiety is the body getting ready to perform in some ways. Like if you think about anxiety before public speaking, before performance, um, even before going to a party where- I was gonna say, where a meeting, any engagement, a meeting, anything. I, I was gonna say, as an introvert, um, where my thoughts are inward a lot, when I go into a party, I have to shift to being very outward. And in some ways, the anxiety is like, turning all your systems on it's yeah. and it's like an it's an energizer it's like giving you all this like burst of energy everything's on yeah it's pulling into the parking lot for an appointment a meeting something that's been scheduled it's typing those numbers into the phone to call somebody for some interview like it's all the ways in which you're headed into something that is unknown or that will require so if, some level of energy. Right. So if you can say in that moment, thank you for, <laughs> yes. thank you for giving me, thank you for this situation that's going to give me what I need for what I'm walking into. Ah, you're converting anxiety into energy. Right. And you're being grateful for it. Okay. I see this is, it's playing, it has a purpose here. <sighs> that's huge. Yeah, I think that's a really big shift. And the next one goes along with that, that anxiety can be a motivator to take an action or make a change. So sometimes we're spinning with anxiety because it's like, it's like our body knows, like, come on, come on. I'm giving you what you need. Like, like you're, you're afraid or you're not sure or whatever it is, but um, I'm, I'm giving you this energy because it's time to focus this, it into something. Wow. Which raises the question, of course, how many times anxiety is there is something you're here to do and you're not doing it. And so there's a built up of like latent energy. Like, like we're yeah. here to exert ourselves in the world somewhere, the ongoing creation of the world, and we're not. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's one of the things that anxiety can be telling us is that it's time. It's time to channel this energy into something. Um, That's great. I, we were recently talking to our friend Josh, who was 
talking about how sometimes pro procrastination can be a good thing. And that surprised me because um, I'm what they call a procrastinator. <laughs> <laughs> I like to get everything done. That's a done. term. It is a term. Oh, you are. That's right. That's I. You I are. like to get everything done early because yes. I am scared that I'm going to run out of time. How many times have I said to you, "Hey, by the way, do you think we should?" And you're like, "Yeah, I did it last Thursday." I know. But, years but here's of that. the thing, with <laughs> with a lot of types of work, they have found through research that procrastination is a good thing, and the reason why is because if you if you procrastinate and you get it done ahead of time, you miss out on that like um, that end kind of pressure that that helps you take it to the next level. So they found that even people who do creative work, and I'm not saying always, but sometimes um, what happens is it looks like procrastination, but they're like mulling it over. They're letting it marinate, and then it gets like the pressure's on, I've got to produce something, and that pressure can be good. That pressure can like force you to like really focus. Like I've... Interesting. And huh. I wouldn't say that you're a procrastinator, but you do, I've noticed that you do kind of work this way sometimes, is you, you let things marinate for a long time. And then I don't think it feels um, scary to you, but when I watch you, I always think, oh, I can't believe you haven't put that together yet. <laughs> Like for a Largo show or something, sometimes you'll just say, yeah, it hasn't come to me yet. Like the, the order or whatever it is, you'll have like all the ideas, but <laughs> the order of it or the how you're going to actually pull it off hasn't come to you yet. And you, I've watched you, you, you can stay calm with that pressure up to like a very, what feels to me like very last minute. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, but huh. I'm just telling you, somebody with anxiety oh, like got it. me, got it. I'm like, oh my word, that would like <laughs> yeah. make me so yeah. anxious. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is because it was a helpful concept for me to see, oh, you're right. Sometimes it's helpful to have pressure because it does help you take your work to the next level. And they've actually found that people can be more creative when they pro procrastinate. Because if you get it done early, you might miss out on some of the last minute process. Oh, yeah. I would call them activating energies. There are certain kinds of energies that stimulate you in ways that you need it and open up new channels of creativity. Right. And saying and this, there's probably healthy procrastination and unhealthy. Oh, uh, yeah. Like unhealthy is just like <laughs> I... <laughs> fear or putting it off forever because. But you know. everybody's just right now still hung up on procrastinating as a phrase they hadn't heard okay. before. I love it. <laughs> All right. So along with this, um, sometimes when you feel that anxiety, it's helpful to ask, what can I channel this energy into? Even if it's something as simple as like exercising, taking a walk. If you, if you think of anxiety as energy um, and you've got all this buildup of energy, what can I do with it? Yeah. Clean out a closet. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, yeah. it could be a helpful way to um, use that energy that's getting built up. Absolutely. Okay, so now that we're convinced that anxiety is your friend, <laughs> um, I have <laughs> three ways here that anxiety is your friend. Um, the first is that anxiety can be a warning light that something needs attention. And... I also have here that, and that something may be us. I love that Anne Lamont quote about how almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. <laughs> and I think sometimes anxiety is your warning light that you've been running too hard for too long and it's not sustainable. Um, and probably at a deeper level, it would be helpful to dig up some of those beliefs that you have about why you need to push so hard. But um, 
for the purpose of this, I think just, just understanding like anxiety is your blinking light on the dashboard, like slow down, take a minute. <laughs> um, yeah. let's figure out what's going on here. And I find that in the cycle of my day, I need what I call a power down. And that's the word that I use with you. I know you've heard it a lot. Like sometimes I just feel spent and out of my element. And I just say it like, I need to go take my power down. And it resets me for the rest of the day. I usually do it around lunchtime. Yeah. Uh, I, this, this idea that anxiety is a, did you say warning light? It's like a warning? Yeah, a warning light. Like on a dashboard of a car. Something isn't working. Right. And anxiety is n the gift of a warning light going, something in your life isn't working. So, I, so as opposed to anxiety then, what I hear you saying, as opposed to anxiety is the problem I need to get rid of, anxiety is like the gift of your system, body, soul, spirit, mind, whatever, telling you, hey, something's not working. Something about the way you're living. Some well, relationship you're, you're in, living. some pattern, some habit, some ad addiction, who knows what it is. Something's not working, and, the, and anxiety is how the fullness of your being in the goodness of the universe and love is speaking to you. Yes. Hey. And we're going to get to that oh, even sorry. more. Did I leap way ahead? No, but I, yeah, I guess no, I'm profound. thinking of this one as even more simple, like even on a daily basis. Oh, like got it. When it pops up, um, maybe it's time to take a nap. Oh, got it. Maybe got it's it, time it. to put the list away. Um, maybe it's time to redefine your definition of success for this day. Ah, right. Just um, like in this minute, this hour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just to like, okay, I'm going to listen. Like in, in the flow of my day, anxiety means step back, whatever it is. Um, That's great. And I, I think I mentioned that before, like, I don't know if this is true about all people who have anxiety. I'm, I'm now wondering right now, but I've always been a list maker. And I haven't in the last, like, I don't know number of years. I've noticed that. But I would hold myself to such a high standard of like all the things that I wanted to get done. And sometimes I think that creates anxiety. And what you need to do is like, it, it's a warning light. Like, hey, you're, you're setting your bar too high. Why do you have such high expectations? You get to set your own expectations. I have this with email. Email, when email has produced anxiety within me and I've started to pay more attention to it. It's amazing to me how many times I'll have anxiety about I really need to return my emails, but I'll actually look at the emails and not one of them needs to be returned. Yeah. In the next hour, in the next half day, none of I'll sometimes realize my email is causing me anxiety and not one of these emails needs to be returned today. There's nothing time sensitive on this. Right. Well, that's what's so funny is we make our own definition yes. of success. Yes. Thank you. And and you can lower the bar. <laughs> yes. You can let yourself feel good. Like what if you lowered the bar and you're like, you know what? I'm going to feel amazing if I get rid of four emails from my inbox. <laughs> I'm going to feel amazing. Lower the bar. And then everything about your day will be better. Absolutely. It is really interesting how these hidden expectations come up in our life and we don't even realize that we're creating these states in ourselves. So part of, ang part of ha living with less anxiety is learning to name what is the expectation or assumption that is floating around in this monkey mind of mine that's actually the thing. That I've placed on myself. That I made. Right. I created something and then I'm bothered because like I, of my failure I could to blame, live up to it. I could blame my culture or everybody else, but the bottom line yeah, is I, bo boring. I bought into it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
Whatever right. you point to, which you just don't have to participate. Again, which isn't to make you feel bad about it. It's just to make you laugh about it. Like, <laughs> I created this. I actually could create something quite different. Yeah. And I could move through my day with more laughter and ease. Seriously, Kristen Bell okay. and Fuego on <laughs> right. fire. So the second one is anxiety reminds us to return. And to me, this is a really big one. And it's also a hard one to define. Anxiety reminds us to, to return. return. And so when I say return, I actually mean a number of different things. Um, and it's, it's that feeling, that state, that's kind of hard to put language to, but it's that place of the best word that I have is that place of connection. Mm -hmm. And when I say connection, <laughs> it also brings up this question of connection to what? Um, so again, it's a language thing. And some people may use the word God. Um, some people may use like source. I love ground of my being. Um, I sometimes love the term universe because to me it speaks of something big and mystical. So to me, it, for me, it's the combination of universe and ground of my being. It's, it's the infinite divine, but it's also my truest self. Interiors, exteriors, infinite, intimate, sure, all this, yeah, love it. Um, so one of the huge things for me about anxiety is it's been a constant motivator to return, to connect, to find my truest self, to, um, to have that feeling of connection that I start the day with. And that to me makes all the difference in the world. And a couple of things that I think are um, pretty key about finding this state is the first one is stillness. Like we're not able to find it when we're in action mode. Um, and most of our waking hours we're, we're in action mode. We're like getting things done. We're solving problems. We're figuring things out. And all of that is good. But to find that connection with our deepest self, with the universe, with um, the flow of life, it takes, it takes stillness. Like I think of that um, every once in a while a Bible verse pops into my head. <laughs> which it is does? funny. Yeah. <laughs> which is funny because uh, I've had a lot of um, needing to leave a lot of that behind. Yeah. But I've also been very conscious of uh, the, the idea that I got from Ken Wilber, which is healthy, healthy growth is about transcend and include. And this is t a total side note, but one of the areas that I have had trouble including has been the Bible mm -hmm. because in my upbringing, the Bible was used. Um, it was just very, very emphasized and used in some ways that were not helpful to me. Yeah. And so um, when I hear Bible verses, a lot of times I get that triggering feeling. Yeah. Um, but I've been very aware that I need to transcend and include, like find the good in it and um, find the stuff I'm grateful for because that's, that's actually when you have peace with your past is when you can find the stuff that you're grateful for so that you're not like, you're not fighting your past anymore, but you're grateful for what it did. But anyway, um, so for a long time, I just had to put the Bible down and... Bible verses especially made me like <laughs> get, just get like tense All on twitchy. the inside. Um, but it's funny because as I've been working on this recently, um, like certain times Bible verses will pop into my head and I think, oh, that's what that was that's about. That's what that meant. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's kind of 
like poetry to me. There's some very profound truths in there. And it's helpful for me to see that humans have always been trying to put language to something that's very hard, if not impossible, to put language to. Mm -hmm. And so when I thought about stillness, the verse that came up for me was um, when Elijah's listening for the voice of God, and it's not in the earthquake, and it's not in the wind, but it's in the whisper, it's in the stillness. It's like um, just that image of when we want to hear the divine, we've got to get really quiet. And I think that means literally quiet, but I think it also means quieting the monkey mind, all the thoughts that pop up. And so again, that goes back to some of the things in your toolbox about how you... How remedy you, box? Is that called remedy box? Remedy box, toolbox. <laughs> Depends on, depends on what works for you. Um, but there's something, I, I think there's also something about when you connect and you listen and you tune in to that deepest part of you. Not only does that calm everything down, recenter you, help you, figure out what you truly value and what you want in life and what your intentions are and all of that. Um, but it also gives your life such great direction. Like, I feel like that's where the magic happens. Like my mystical side, I have a very practical side, which is why I like the research and the tools and all of this. But I also have a very mystical side and to me, this place where you get still and you connect and you listen, that's where the magic happens. And I'm not even sure what I mean by magic because, again, it's just that thing that's <laughs> ha very hard to define. But mm -hmm. sometimes it's a flash of inspiration. Um, sometimes it's just a returning to what you know and how you want to live. Um, but I feel like this part is where so many things spill out from. Like having this part of connection, um, it's the base of where, it's the base of where change happens. Um, and to me, the word spirituality is about connection and expansion. And those are the two things that make me just completely excited about life is this kind of connection and then I feel like out of this kind of connection expansion happens which is how we change how we grow how we transform and I love that word that you and Liz were using the zhuzh zhuzh absolutely it's the, the it's the zhuzh of life <laughs> um which that word makes me laugh because again it's it's making up a word to describe this thing that is so absolutely hard to put into words. Yeah, yeah. But it really is everything. Um, so I think that there are other ways to find this connection. I think we find it anytime we connect with love, um, whether it's, you know, love of something big and ineffable or it's um love of an actual flesh and blood human being um it can put us in that state of connection i think gratitude beauty anytime we experience beauty or awe um being in nature so um i think that anxiety is our friend when it reminds us, it's like that symptoms that's bothersome enough yeah. that it makes us return. Yeah. I mean, I, th I feel like in that moment we have a choice. Like we can either, like I said, go down the spiral and push and shame and all of that, or we can let us, let it remind us to return. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, oh wow, if anxiety pops up for me, 
five times today, I get five reminders to return. Mm, I always picture a path and, and anxiety is like, oh, I stepped off the path. Yeah. Oh, so I guess it's over there. Is it over there? Uh, well, I've always loved path? it when you talk about the Hebrew yeah, word to for re repentance. repent. Yeah, to return. It's to return. And it was always, it was never, you never, it was never about beating yourself up that you stepped off the path. It was, oh my word, God must love you to have shown you that you stepped off the path. Wow. You're thrilled uh, that you, this has been revealed to you. Great. But I have a sense that you're just getting going. Well, let's go, for, let's go for number three. <laughs> <laughs> number three is anxiety is a truth teller. It wants to tell you something. I love it. When I first I know, heard you I saying that. I think this that. is the one you like the most. Uh, I just, it's so great. Um, anxiety can indicate that this is something you really care. Something's going on that you really care about. Um, anxiety wants to take us into a life with greater meaning doesn't allow you to just skim the surface. Um, it can help you define what's most important to you. And if you stop and listen, it can take you into those places of depth where you live a life of what you really believe in, what, you, what really matters to you. So sometimes anxiety is, is just saying, hey, this matters to you, pay attention. Or it might be saying, wake up. There's something new that wants to come through you. So, invita so anxiety is like telling, is an invitation to stop skimming the surface. There's some depth here, and you're just floating across the top of it. Well, anxiety can make us, um, in our efforts to get rid of it, it can make us be really busy. Yeah. Or... Um, uh, there's other ways that it comes across in our lives, like um, perfectionism, over busyness, um, never wanting those quiet spaces because that's when we feel it the most. Um, it's interesting. Am I interrupting? I don't mean interrupting. No, go. Um, how many times I would say yes to things because I wanted everybody to like me? And it produced all this anxiety in me because I was just pulled in all these directions. And the anxiety was an invitation to go into the depths of why do I feel this tremendous need to say yes? Why is it so important to me that everybody thinks that I can do it all? And yes. anxiety was the way into, oh, because of this. Oh, that leads to this. That leads to this. Otherwise, you, you just skim the surface without yeah. asking, why do I do this? Why do I say yes to this? Why do I always say no to that? Why am I bothered by this person? Um, you just stay anxious instead of following that question where it leads, which will always be into greater depth and wisdom and understanding, probably involve costs and disruptions, and you'll come out the other side a better person. Well, it's like your, your body knows something that maybe <sighs> your conscious it's mind a step ahead. doesn't doesn't yes. know or doesn't want to deal with yet, but it's like your, your body knows something is going on here. How often does our body know the truth before our brain? It feels like a lot. Doesn't it? It <laughs> yes. feels like you, especially you and I lately, this growing awareness that the body knows and it's telling us the truth so, and, it, and the brain is just catching up to what the body picked up on a long time ago. Oof. Yeah, so a couple ideas about what, um, some examples of what this could look like. Um, the anxiety could be an invitation, like is it time to make a change? Um, it could be, is it time to end something? I love how you talk about necessary endings and that how you want it to be a graduation before it's a divorce. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes anxiety yeah. is... is we're done here. You actually know right. it's time yeah. to end this, this and is move over. on. Yeah. But you're not quite quite ready to face it. Um, it's a chance to listen to your own inner guidance, not what you think everyone else thinks and not what you see everyone else around you doing, but your own truth. So sometimes I think anxiety indicates to us you're not following your own truth. You're like looking all around you like... 
What, what are, what they, are they doing? Yeah, right. Or would they think this is okay? But inside, you actually know. It's just hard to face. Man. And um, one last piece on this. I, I read this book by this doctor, Lisa Rankin, and she said that she started having her patients write their own prescriptions. She, for anxiety? Well, no, no, not for anxiety, but just for... Um, I think she worked with a lot of people who had more chronic health issues mm -hmm. where there wasn't an obvious solution. And she started having them write their own prescriptions, like, what do you think you need? And she said it was amazing because when people got quiet and really thought about it, they actually knew what they needed to do for their health. Not, not like exercise or eat better, but like what change needed to be made or what thing were they not listening to that they needed to listen to. And then she ended up writing a second book about fear because she said people could come up with their own prescriptions, but the hardest part then was overcoming the fear to carry it out. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. But that's always struck me that a lot of times we do know. We do know what we yeah, need. Absolutely. And anxiety is that truth teller telling us, hey, there's something here, it's time to listen. Yeah, 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 and, absolutely. And if you don't listen, then the, the, the signs just get louder. <laughs> so yeah. true. Wow, Kristen Bell, this is so much. It's so, it's so great. Yeah, I'd love to end with this one last tool that I think is like the queen of all tools. <laughs> I really do. I <laughs> so believe in this tool. Oh, fantastic. It's like really practical yeah. and really mystical. So it checks, it's both, you. Of, it checks both of those boxes. That is, that is, that's your two and favorite it, things. It's really simple mm -hmm. um, and efficient, which is why I'm going to give you a little research at the beginning. Okay. Because um, sometimes we, when things are really simple, we need to be convinced that they actually work. So that's funny. Yeah. Um, they've done lots of research about what happens when you take out a notebook and you write about your feelings. So um, I'm going to give you a specific study in a minute, but overall, the research has shown that when people spend as little as 15 minutes a session, um, three times a week for three weeks, uh, they have significant, imp actually, I don't even think it's three weeks. I think it's one week. So minimal amount of effort. Um, they find that people have significant improvements in their mental health. They report less depression, less anxiety, less anger, less medication use. And they also report significant well, this isn't a report. These are actually um, tests that they do, but they have significant improvements in their physical health. They have improved liver function, improved immune function, decreased pain. And then on the practical side, they find that people who engage in writing about their feelings um, have better grades and better work performance. So, this is a very practical study that was done just to emphasize this. And this one wowed me because um, a long time ago, I took a graduate entrance exam. And so <laughs> I remember like the stress of you're, you're preparing for these exams, you're trying to get into schools. Um, you just you don't know if you know what you're supposed to know, all of that. You don't know if you're smart enough. You, you're wondering where your life is going to go. There's a lot of anxiety around um, taking a graduate entrance, entrance exam. So what they did is they took two groups of people and they had them do three writing sessions for 15 minutes each, um, once a week for three weeks. So that's such a minimal amount of time. That's 15 minutes a week. Um, with group one, they had them write about their deepest thoughts and feelings about the exam. With group two, 
they had them write about the contents of their closet. So <laughs> they weren't allowed to write about any emotions, <laughs> beliefs, or opinions. And this is the part that is amazing. They had them take a pretest for the graduate entrance exam and then a post test. And the people who did the writing about their feelings, their scores increased by 75 points, an average Whoa. of 75 points. Um, Whoa. Which is amazing, like how, how helpful that is to, and I'm assuming that a lot of the writing was about anxiety, fears, and somehow through the writing they were able to get to the other side. And it affected performance that much. Yes. Just writing out your feelings not only affects like actual metrics and tangible performance, but it also, your liver is functioning better. Yeah, that is, that is right. astounding. Right, and, and so in applying this to anxiety, um, for researchers, that's a little bit harder to measure um, because it's, it's based on self-report. Mm -hmm which is why they choose something like pre-test and post-test. Yeah. Um, but they, uh, researchers have gotten really excited about this tool because it really works. And um, it's very effective. And it's as old as the hills. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's just as basic and straightforward as it gets. I know, which is why <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. helpful to start with. Yeah. Um, being convinced that this really does something. Um, and one other way that we can apply it really specifically to anxiety is letting your anxiety speak to you when you're, as you're writing. Um, some helpful questions are, why are you here? What do you want? What do you want to say to me? So you, you sit down with a notebook and you have a conversation with your anxiety. Ah, so to the anxiety, you say, why are you here? Right. What do you want to say to me? You're like interviewing your anxiety. Right, and I think it's an amazing way to get to what is actually causing this. Because sometimes anxiety just feels like, I don't know, I'm just anxious about everything. But then as you dig down, there's like a root. There's like a, a, yes. a thing that um, if you just expose it to the light, Sometimes yeah. that's all it needs is because you see, oh, I don't actually, like, this is silly. I don't, I don't need to hang on to this. Like, this is making me miserable. Um, and I yeah. call that, sometimes that's the monster under the bed. Yeah. Like, it feels really big and scary when you're laying there in bed with the lights off. But when you turn the lights on and look under the bed, you're like, oh, that's what this is. That's what's causing all of this. Like, I don't need to believe this. I actually am going to feel much better if I could turn this around. Yeah. So again, you realize that you have more control than you realize when you're able to get at the root of what's causing your anxiety. And I think that's what's so brilliant about sitting down in the quiet and the stillness with a notebook and either writing about how you're feeling or being more directive and asking anxiety questions and trying to get at the bottom of, of what it is, I think in that process, your, your truest self, the ground of your being, like it's able to come up and have, it's able to come up and have some air time. Like I find when I, sit down with my notebook and write about something that's really bothering me, I become my own therapist. Yes. I, I, I'm yes. able to like write out the, the raw feelings and what feels true, but then as I'm writing, it slowly shifts. It like, I start to get like a different perspective on it. I start to see, oh, I could, I could see it this way or okay, I see what I need to focus on instead. So it's a really, um, I find it kind of a magical process. 
because stuff comes up that I didn't know was in me. Yeah. And I mean that not in the sense of like the deep, dark stuff. I guess sometimes that's true, but more my inner wisdom yeah. comes out that I didn't know was there before I sat down and wrote. And I've tried to take shortcuts. I've tried to do it without writing. And it, it never seems to work. I mean, it works in small ways because I think once you start having this writing practice, you start to see how you can turn around any thought. Like, oh, that's huge. Okay, this is what I'm believing, but do I know 100% that this is true? And the answer is always no. I don't actually know this is true. So, what if I could turn this? So, I feel like I have gotten better just in my everyday thoughts at, at getting them turned a bit. Okay, so the question is like, how do I turn this? Yeah. Once you've named it. So you're like, it's a skill. You're getting better and better at asking the question, how do I turn this? And then turning it from uh, a debilitating, crippling something to an empowering, truth-telling something. Right, or even I'm feeling this, anxious, angry, distressed, depressed. Trapped, yeah. Um, because of this, because of fill in the blank. And then looking at it at, and realizing, okay, I can, I can turn this a little bit and maybe see it from a different perspective, but I also am seeing, um, I don't have to react this way. Like, it feels like I have to react this way. It feels like these are my only options. But when I start writing things down, I realize that I have other options, other ways of reacting, other ways of feeling. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting process. Um, but it's been the thing that has helped me more than anything when I feel stuck. Man, that's fantastic. I can hear people listening to this episode getting notebooks out. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and actually one last thought, because I mentioned before that anxiety always comes from perceived threat. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that the threat's not real, but it does mean that I, I guess what perceived means to me is that there's always a choice in the matter. Like there's always a choice of how you're going to react to it, how you're going to see, see it. And sometimes our patterns are so ingrained that we just react to it. But when we can step back, get out that notebook, say, okay, if anxiety is perceived threat, what do I feel threatened by here? What am I afraid of here? And then it's like, it kind of breaks down the process where we have more control then over how we see it, how we react to it. Um, there's a lot of things that are out of our control, but we can control how we react to it, how we see it. And to me, yeah. the writing process is how I get there because everything else is, um, not everything else, but so many things are habitual reactions. Um, uh, my, somewhere yeah. in my yeah, brain, yeah. I have associated um, this person, this situation um, is danger. Danger, danger, danger. And there's like that wiring happened a long time ago. Or like for me, I had something traumatic for an eighth grader happen in eighth grade. And I can see how a lot of my wiring around friendships formed at that, in that place. And so um, a lot of things for me, how I'm perceiving people, it's very automatic. But if I can take it into a notebook and break it down, 
then it becomes less automatic and more um i'm i'm in control here i'm choosing yeah yeah, yeah. how i'm reacting i'm choosing how i'm feeling i'm choosing how i'm seeing it <sighs> Man, oh man. Yeah, that was a lot, huh? Everybody together now. So I don't know. I hope you had a good. lot of dishes to wash. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this so, was like dishes so, part one or dishes so, part two. <laughs> Just in this episode. <laughs> oh, thank you for all this. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah, it's really great. It's really great. Thank you. Well, I have a feeling that w we're tired, so I can't imagine how everybody else is feeling oh, right now. I, it's just so it's just a lot to think about. Yeah. Energized, ready to go. Great. All right, everybody. Grace and peace from me and Kristen Bell. This has been part 2. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>